least spending our money to build a port for them. Yeah, um, it's Joe Biden's reason. We need to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. I don't think we should. I, I don't think any of our aid that goes to Israel to support our greatest ally, arguably maybe in the world, to defeat Hamas and Iran and Russia, and probably North Korea is in there and China too, with them and helping helping uh, uh, Hamas. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. It, it should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Get it over quick. Obviously, that was not a call for for nuking the Palestinians. Not not at all. We will, uh, of course, go over Tim Wahlberg's explanation, explanification that he gave uh, after making that remark last week. I guess I'm 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 late on this because this was uh, over a full week ago. But uh, kind of a big story in the news. Yeah, uh, inter- internationally, not just not just oh, the really? usual. Well, I guess it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, not just po- folks in Michigan talking, but everyone's been talking about that. So we definitely got to talk about that. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Rescue Michigan Weekly live stream. Hey, Patty, how you doing? Hey, good. good. How are you? Good. You got plans for the solar eclipse tomorrow? No, I don't have any no. plans for that. You're not no. going to go see it? Uh-huh. I'm sorry? You're not going to go see it? I don't know. Can I just see it from anywhere? I mean, obviously, I'm not supposed well, to look the, at it, right? But <laughs> the, the, the band of totality. The border is like Luna Pier, it like just comes into Michigan. So we're not going to be in the band of totality. If you drive down to Toledo, which for me is only like 30 miles south of me, oh, then it'll be going? completely dark for like three minutes. So I'm going to go down and check that out. Are you, what time are you going? Uh, I don't know. I think that it's supposed to happen like around one, but I don't know how insane traffic might be. I don't know it's if it's going to be like the entire that. state going down to Ohio to see it. It's like a one in 20 years thing. So I don't know. Well, the first time I, I, no I remember it was I was in elementary school <laughs> and I know I, I was either first or second grade because that's when my classroom was on that side of the building. And, and we all I remember we all went to the windows, but I don't, we yeah. didn't go outside. I, I don't it was I'm just kind of happy. I mean, obviously it was, you know, yeah, I don't have any of glasses, I don't have full recollection of it, but. Um, no, because, yeah. you know, plus I work in person now Monday through Wednesday. So my oh. I, I mean, if I was still working from home, maybe, but. I don't know. It's kind of yeah. I don't have any of those things. solar eclipse glasses. I have no idea where you buy those things anyway. But I just want to see it be dark during the day. That's kind of neat. You don't see that every day. Yeah. So I'm well, when I was in Vegas in October, there was one out there. I don't know how if it was a hundred percent. I mean, I was out by the pool when it was going on. Like the pool was full, and I didn't even know it was happening. So I walked out in the morning, and uh, I'm like, all these people are like, standing like right by the doors. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, yeah, like, oh. totally like glasses. So I mean, I looked. I borrowed their glasses. I looked at it, um, out there. Well, but, and, I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. It's supposed to be pretty neat, so we'll see. I'm sure anyway. it is. I just don't know. I mean, I guess I could just leave work. If it's yeah. Anyway, we'll so tonight we've got some uh, some stories to cover. The thing that drives me bonkers is, I mean, the the big story is well, not the big story, but the thing that's going on that's damaging our lives is always. Democrats actually doing radical things like passing radical legislation. We did two emails about them this week, including one yesterday where, um, uh, uh, what's her face? Um, not Sue Shink. Winnie one of them. One of the Senate Republicans, um, not McMorrow. No, maybe it was McMorrow. One of them one called of the for Democrats, the lady with the abortions. Uh, maybe it is, uh, may- maybe it was McMorrow actually called for repealing the informed consent law that says that... Uh, Winnie Brinks? Winnie Brinks, that was it. Thank you. Senate Majority Leader Winnie Brinks. So not like, you know, not one of these off-the-wall, hardcore, crazy Democrats like Jamie Churches or anything. No, Senate Majority Leader Winnie Brinks. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's just repeal the, uh, you know, the law that says that, um, you know, at least one parent or guardian has to approve before an abortionist can, you know, you know, kill the baby within... What's a, the rationale while well, some kids... Their parents might get upset or something. I mean, it's something as stupid as that. Parents might say no. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Or which the, you know, know, they don't want to get in trouble. Because you know, they might, you know, they might need to have someone that's like an adult who knows like about the health risks of an abortion, for example. But the Democrats, there is no such thing. So no, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's 
and you know we're going to be doing another email this week talking about uh, the push for the homeschool registry. Uh, there was Sue Shink, no Bayer. <laughs> These Democrat women, well, Rosemary Bayer, there. talking about we need to have more we need to have more gun rights restrictions in the in the state senate. That's co- that, that's coming. In fact, Merz News said um, uh, Brinks was teasing <laughs> teasing the idea of removing um, uh, parental consent for abortion. Uh, anyway, so the Democrats are like oh, doing all these things. Not oh, to say nothing about what the federal Democrats are doing. Um, and here we are, got to talk about the things Republicans are saying because that's what's going to be in the campaign season is all the crazy stuff Republicans are saying. And here we have Tim Wahlberg just kind of casually thrown out there. And let's, let's, uh, by the way, let's, let's look at what Tim Wahlberg says about this because obviously people are saying he is calling for nuking. Nuking the Palestinians, which clearly is not what he said, uh, other than just saying it has to be like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, mm-hmm. He said, "So here's what here's what Tim Wahlberg's clarification is. Hold on, let me bring bring this up on the screen here." He says, um, he's, "He's walking back his remarks here. Let me make this bigger." As a child that grew up in the Cold War era, playing the age card. The quicker these wars end, the fewer innocent lives will be caught in the crossfire. He continued, the sooner Hamas and Russia surrender. Yeah. The easier we move. Oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's that's what's about to happen. Well, why'd they they stop the peace deal by sending Boris Johnson? They could have stopped it like within, when was that? Within a month? But that wasn't Russia surrendering. That was the the problem. Well, I know, but there's (laughs) like half a million dead or injured. Yeah. Combined between Ukraine and Russia. And, And. yeah, well, you see, the obvious answer is just to nuke Russia. Wait, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that 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 might not be a that might not be prudent because Russia also has nukes. <laughs> There's that little little wrinkle there. Yeah, well, is, in, in his remark, he didn't mention Russia originally. Well, he kind of did, but he says the sooner Ru- Hamas and Russia surrender, the easier it'll be to move forward. The use of this metaphor, along with the removal of context. Well, let's watch that clip again. We'll see what the context is. I don't know. I mean, he it's like he used the thought and he switched thoughts midstream. Like, I don't know. It was confusing anyway. Let me maybe the third time watching it, I'll understand what he said. Hold on. Let me uh okay, let's do this bit by bit here. Here we go. So here's here's the context that Wahlberg says we left out, or the media left out. So here you see the constituent says, Why are we spending money? Our money to build a port for them. Let's play. He's spending our money to build a port for them. So the constituents saying, this is of course because Joe Biden gave that ridiculous remark in his State of the Union speech, saying we're going to build a port in Gaza, where after however many weeks or months it takes to build the port, <laughs> then we can send humanitarian aid into Gaza by sea, as opposed to you know just directing the Israelis to allow humanitarian aid, in which obviously they're not going to do because. Uh, they well, we saw it just happened recently this week. Um, <laughs> Joe Biden had a call with Netanyahu uh, after um, Israel deliberately killed like seven international humanitarian aid workers, including an American and I think some British people. Uh, there's what was it called? The World WCK World Something Kitchen. Anyway, it was like you know, very, uh, very big international incident. And uh, you know, so, so Biden calls Netanyahu and uh, you know, now suddenly Israel's like, oh yeah, we'll let him maintain it. Now, now that now that you know, people like uh, we don't want to die sending this mm-hmm. stuff in. So now that now that the trucks have already turned around, no, now, that, now they're going to say, yeah, we're going to let some humanitarian aid anyway. So constituents asking, why are we spending our money to build a port for uh, for the Palestinians? And this is what Tim Albrecht says. Yeah, um, it's Joe Biden's reason. We need to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. All right, so, so he's, he's saying yeah. he's blaming Joe. Well, he's saying that it, Joe Biden's idea, which it, it was Joe Biden's idea, which is an insane idea. But Wahlberg, now to put this in context, right? But even his sentence, it's Joe Biden's reason. Like, or, or instead of this is Joe Biden's reason, like just he does he not speak well in general? Well, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, okay, so. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I can see there's lots of good ways to spin this as, yeah, Joe Biden's reason, and this is a really boneheaded idea because Israel has taken billions of dollars from us and we shouldn't need to have to build a port just to bring food in if we need to. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not where he's going with this. And again, the context of this, of course, is that millions of people are very upset with Joe Biden's handling of the Gaza crisis, in particular, 
Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, people who up until now would have probably been a wholly owned property of the Democrat Party. And now Joe Biden is doing things that for them is a fundamental issue that they cannot abide by because he is clearly 100 percent condoning everything that Israel's been doing. And now they're very, very mad because they thought the Democrats were going to be not like that. And especially because the situation's gotten completely out of control. I mean, more Palestinians have been killed in the last five months than have been killed in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're kind of very upset about this now. And the Republicans' response is, let's go even harder in supporting Israel. Like, let's not, let's not do anything we possibly could to get those voters into our party. That'd be a very, that'd, that'd be a very bad thing for us to have Arabs and Muslims turning away from the Democratic Party, maybe voting for us as a possible alternative, you know, because, you know, Trump kind of was good for peace in the Middle East. You know, they might have, they, they might actually see things that way. Whereas Joe Biden, under his leadership, everything fell apart completely. You know, there's an argument we made there, but no. Anyway, so this is what Tim Walberg's saying. He's saying Joe Biden's reason for building this port was his, not mine. What I'd prefer to do is there. I don't think we should. I, I don't think any of our aid that goes to Israel to support our greatest ally, arguably maybe in the world. Okay, so this is a sentence he does not finish. Right. <laughs> so I don't um, think any of our aid that goes to Israel to support our greatest ally should what? Then he then he yeah, starts so, talking about the other side. Like, yeah, what is you don't think any of our aid should do what? Yeah, by the way, Israel our our greatest ally in what? The Ukraine war? Has Israel been sending the Ukrainians their their spare artillery shells, something like that? Whatever. But let's let's ignore that for now. He goes on. To defeat Hamas and Iran and Russia. And probably North Korea's in there and China too. So he never gets to finishing what he's saying about the aid. The right. aid that we give to Israel to defeat Hamas, uh uh it's helping the sentence doesn't make any sense. But you see what he's trying to try, trying to say here is we give aid to, well, he says aid to Israel, but he's really complaining about aid we give to Palestinians because that is helping Hamas, he says. Mm -hmm. So this goes on. With them and helping, helping, yeah. By the way, notice also what he just casually does here. Hamas, Iran, Russia, Probably North Korea's in there too, China. These are all the countries you want to do something about. These are all the countries we're at war with. Although we're not at war with any of them officially, but these are all countries that we view as our enemies. Yeah. Hamas. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. Okay. That's a libertarian position, frankly, although it also applied to aid for Israel, which of course Tim Wahlberg does support. You know, mm -hmm. that's because you could make that argument. I mean, I, I would make that argument. Um that's kind of the Trump argument. America first, remember that? That's our tax dollars. If you want to support Israel or the Palestinians with your money, go right ahead. They'll take your money. But when you want to send tax dollars to Israel or the Palestinians or anybody else in the world, it's not your money that you're asking the government to spend because you can just give them your money. It's everybody else's money that you want the government to give to them. Yeah, that's a fair argument. But then he goes into... A little far off from the Ron Paul argument here. It should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Yeah. From here to there. It should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So that's that's the context. That's exactly what Wabrick said. Nothing more, nothing less. So the context is if only we had some horrific show of force, we could end these wars very, very quickly. Which uh, how are you going to do that, Tim Wahlberg? Since you brought up Russia now in your in your uh, in your in your comments to the media, this is your damage control. <laughs> this is Wahlberg's damage control. The sooner Hamas and Russia surrender, easier be, now. And this uh, this is getting to where where Wahlberg is really coming from here. It's not this BS explanation he's giving to the to, to the media. It's the absolute frustration that there's nothing they can do about what's going on in, in Ukraine right now. They've given the Ukrainians everything short of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. The F-16s are, they're on their way. I don't know what, they're not going to do any good <laughs> against S-300s and you know everything else the Russians have. But they're but everything short of nuclear weapons they've given to Ukraine. They, and every time, remember, every time it was the game changer. 
Oh, we're going to send them. Yeah, this the, is going to be it. Yeah, this is going to be Patriot it. Yeah. missile defense is going to change the game. The high Mars is going to change the game. The attack of missile is going to change the game. The storm shadow missiles, they're going to change the game. All this stuff was going to be a game changer. And all of it has been absolute crap. <laughs> None of it's done any good. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians killed and wounded. And the clock's ticking. Like, this week, this week, um, Biden desperately called Xi Jinping tries to get him to um to uh break away from russia and ping's like no <laughs> you don't tell <laughs> us what to do you're not telling us who we trade with forget it uh the end and also by the way taiwan is our bright 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 red line don't you dare cross us on taiwan so um yeah. <laughs> says probably using our equipment brandon left in afghanistan i mean this is this is a this is a problem that the neocons got themselves into. They wanted to go to war with Russia. They thought they were going to destroy Russia with sanctions. They thought they were going to destroy the Russian military. Remember from the first month, they were saying, we're going to annihilate them. We're, they're going to run out of missiles. Um, and then there's going to be regime change. There are Russian people. Are, and that's why what's happening in Russia these days. Terror attacks. Because what else are they going to do? <laughs> There's nothing else they can do militarily. The the, the best hope they had was probably the Prigozhin uh, revolt, which completely fizzled out. Putin just won another, what is it, six-year term they have in Russia? Six years? No more regime change in Russia. They are screwed. So mm -hmm. what's Wahlberg doing now? He's just bemoaning the fact that they have no options in Russia. And what's going on in Israel? Well, they just bombed an Iranian consulate in Damascus. Looks like Iran is not taking the bait. So they're they, they're trying to get us into a wider war with Iran. Iran doesn't want a wider war. The U.S. doesn't want a wider war. And uh, this is, the situation is just not sustainable. I mean, they're, what do they do? Kill every single Palestinian? I mean, they're 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 making it towards that direction, but oh, they want at, some point, <laughs> at some point, international pressure is going to break, and. There's just nothing you can do. So that's what Tim Wahlberg just had was a infantile outburst at a constituent event. That will be fodder for the Democrats. Fodder for the Democrats. As Biden fails in every foreign policy aspect of his own making, Wahlberg is like, we should have been even more extreme than Biden was. That's that's the face that he puts on the Republican Party. Thanks, Tim running, Wahlberg. Is he running for re-election, Wahlberg? Oh, yeah. Wahlberg is, he actually lost his seat for one term, and then he came back. This was like in, I want to say, 2014, maybe 2012. No, 2012, I think, Barama, Barack Obama's re-elect. I think he lost his seat for, maybe it was 2008. So what does so, he have now? Does he have that district that's like all the way across the bot, that weird? Yeah, it used to include, it used, it used to include where I live. I used to, used to, I used to be his constituent. but in the I thought, yeah. Washington, yeah, Washington went out, and I think they picked up Berrien County on the southwest tip. But um, I used to get invited to Tim Wahlberg's town halls. And because, you know, he'd spam his constituents. And it, I, I listened to see what he was saying to people. And every time I was like, what are we going to do about the border? Well, we got to elect more Republicans. That was always his answer for everything. Well, was, well, it's all Joe Biden's doing. It's all the Democrats are doing. Got to yeah. elect more Republicans. Okay, well, you guys yeah. aren't fixing that either. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jason Mickelberg also says, can't really blame Putin for not wanting the Biden crime family operating in Ukraine, however. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I mean, Putin has said, he said to the media, I'd rather have Biden in office. Than Trump because Biden's predictable and he's completely mm -hmm. incompetent. Um, what's going on on Rumble? Anything? Uh, Hurlbeck is heading to Fidley, <laughs> Finley, Ohio. So I guess that's oh, a, for the eclipse. Yeah, yeah, yeah for the, uh, for the Scott, eclipse. From, Scott from YouTube said the eclipse is at 3 14 p.m. tomorrow. That must be the, the full. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I assume that he means like near where Ohio is. I don't know. I'm going to figure this yeah. out all tonight. I know I've not, yeah. I've not really. Figured out my plans yet exactly, but I, it's definitely sometime in the afternoon. I assume he's right about that. Um, John King has a clip, which I'm not queued up to play, but apparently Wahlberg talks about this in this video here. Uh, so there we go. But let's move on to another topic. We've been talking about Wahlberg for a while now. <laughs> and, um, and there is uh, another, another story we have here. This is, uh, and now we must return to... Uh, the uh, well-trodden topic of Christina Caramo's Republican Party. And uh, by the way, who's apparently going to be running for state chair again. There was a deadline Detroit had her interviewed 
uh, a day or so ago, and she says she really wants to be the chair again. So that's presumably in the cards, which is something we can all look forward to at our upcoming county conventions. Are we going to elect people that uh, would put Christina Caramo back in charge? We'll see. Um, but we have, this is a story from the Kent County Republican Party, uh, which is completely controlled by Karamo's followers. And uh, Bigger Truth Media picked up on this the other day. Uh, they have an event coming up. I can't believe this event is still posted, by the way, after this came out. Common law and the Constitution. Know your rights. And this is, uh, this is, um, oh yeah, John's saying, can you mark shower on the Obama turnout? Yeah, he served one term in Tim Wahlberg's district, and then Wahlberg came back. And it, yes, in 2008. Thank you for clarifying that, John. Um, when we were talking with Scott McMahon uh, this past Monday, we were talking about how he has this operating thesis that the intention of the deep state handlers behind Karamo and all these other efforts in other states is to radicalize the Republican Party, make it extreme. And here's what we see them doing. They're bringing this guy, and this is the this is their event coming up April 18th. Common law and the Constitution. Know your rights. And there is a copy of the um, the preamble to the Constitution there. You see it there. Come get educated about what our forefathers did by writing the Constitution, to be capitalized, and our Bill of Rights. We the people have the power. John Nix is a single father. I don't know why they call attention to him being a single father. There you go. Who took on Cedar Springs public schools against their unconstitutional mandates and won in federal court by using common law and his constitutional rights. Hmm. Did he though? Let's 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 pause here. Did John Nix win? Because that would be a story. Like I would have covered that story if John Nix had won against uh, an unconstitutional mandate. I assume we're talking about something COVID related. Mm-hmm. And Cedar Springs Public Schools, uh, obviously, a lot of school districts trample over our rights during the COVID era. Let's see here. How did it go for John Nix? I wonder. Um, let's bring up the oh, let's bring up the PDF, shall we? Um, because uh, you know, when there is a uh, Oh, hold on, where'd my Adobe go? Hold on, I gotta pull this up again. Um, when you have a uh, court case, you actually get uh, a uh, printed record of what the results are. And uh, I guess we'll have to, you guys have to decide for yourselves if you think this is a uh, win here. Um, okay, I've got the document pulled up and I just gotta share the screen. But here is this definitely looks like this is the case John Nix versus. Uh, Versus Cedar Springs Public Schools. Uh, here we go. Let's make this a uh, bit, bit bigger here. Johnny Robert Nix, motion hearing. Uh, and then you see here is the guy's name. Cedar Springs, Michigan. Sounds like this is the case. Uh, and then appearing on behalf of the defendants who are uh, the Cedar Springs Public Schools. You have their lawyer there. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the, I'm getting ahead of myself here. This is the uh, conclusion. Um, First, you have the recommendation. This is a recommendation. Uh, So we have an action brought by Pro Se. That means representing himself, plaintiff Johnny Robert Nix against Cedar Springs and um, these various, uh, I guess, the school board members. The complaint should be dismissed, they say. Nix refers to his amended complaint as a motion to amend, comma, court of claims and filed in the state of Michigan, um, which uh, it wasn't. It was filed in federal court. So, oops. Um, but there he goes. He asserts that, uh, well, they say it does uh, not conform to the rules of federal rules of civil procedure, does not contain a short and plain statement of the grounds of the court's jurisdiction, does not, anyway, just not everything. It's all very bad. Uh, the thrust of the complaint is that defendant Cedar Springs does not have the authority of force of emergency orders. And the guy wrote his own lawsuit and uh, appears to be based on convoluted theory that the defendants have violated constitutional rights. And so, yada, 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 we recommend dismissing the case with prejudice. And the judge, amazingly, uh, did that. <laughs> Dismissed the case. And uh, he says, uh, the court concludes the plaintiff did not even have standing to bring the suit on behalf of the residents of Kent County. Uh, nevertheless, the court proceeds on the assumption the plaintiff has standing uh, out of an abundance of caution because 
the uh, plaintiff is representing himself, uh, and therefore the court is very liberally construing his filings. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the plaintiff makes references to this and that. The court adopts the recommendation, uh, dismissing the case. The court concludes the plaintiff did not plead sufficient facts to state a cause of action. The court adopts that report, uh, except for the bit about the standing, which even still he, they dismissed the case. So uh, that's the case. Uh, that's not a one case. That is a lost case. Um, cut to one year later. And now there is a hearing on the fees. And here is Mr. Nix, the expert that will be speaking to the Kent County Republicans. And here is how it goes. Everyone's um, an expert, huh? Mr. Nix, are you here? Mr. Nix responds, I'm a man with a living soul that walks upon the land here for a special divine appearance. All right, okay. all right. What I'm interested <laughs> now is whether you're Mr. Nix. So Mr. Nix responds, John Robert Nix, to invoke the laws of the Republican Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitutional Records in this court to establish in this case that this case was terminated by Paul Maloney on February 24th. Are you Mr. Nix? <laughs> Mr. Nix. I have an ID that says Mr. Nix. I am here as a living man. Nicknamed? Okay. Nicknamed. Yes, it's on my ID, but it's a nickname. Um, I'm here as a living man. Okay, Mr. Well, Nix, I'm going to resolve this issue today. But this is just advice for you, which I offer based upon my long experience as a lawyer and my shorter experience as a judge. Before I was a lawyer, I was a criminal defense. Before I was a judge, I was a criminal defense lawyer. I represented a series of men who believed in sovereign citizen theory. I don't know if that's what you believe in or not. Kind of sounds like it might be related to that, you think? Um, I just want you to know that there's no basis in law or fact for sovereign citizen theory. Uh, and a series of my clients out of a federal prison, one from your general area somewhere. It's been 20 years or more now. I defended him as best I could, but he was convicted. He got out. Um, and he died in prison. And before he died, he just wanted to apologize to me for the deep regret that he bought into this theory. I was a fool. Just trying to warn you, Mr. Nix, you might not want to proceed by this path you're going. So Mr. Nix says, for the record, I'm not here to make a public disturbance. I'm just strictly here to adjudicate the facts on the record. And the court says, that's what we're going to do. And I have questions asking the facts that I have submitted from the beginning of this case, which is why they've been ignored and why constitutional avoidance has occurred. I'm not, this is, this is a hearing for sanctions. So the defendants have now brought a, a contempt of court request because Mr. Nix has not paid the $1,800 the court ordered him to pay in the defendant's legal fees for bringing a meritless case. So that's what they're doing here today. So the judge says, you sound like a smart guy. You've been very articulate. You haven't caused any commotion here. You're behaving as a gentleman, which is all I ask of anybody who appears in this court. Um, so yeah, we're here in a motion, like I just said, to pay the attorney's fees. Um, and uh, Mr. Nix says, can you clarify which response you have read? Actually, I've read both of them. Uh, he goes on. There's a little back and forth here. Uh, and then... <laughs> The judge says, my first question is for you, Mr. Ruse. Is there anything, you know, I've read your pleadings. Is there anything else you wish to say? Mr. Nix, may I object real quick? No, because he gets a chance to speak. You'll get a chance to speak when he's finished. Anything else you wish to say uh, to the to the defendants? He says, no, Your Honor, rather than belabor the court's time, I'll just rely on the brief submitted. If Your Honor has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Court, fair enough. No questions. Oh they all know what's going on here, except Mr. Nix. Mr. Nix, we are here today. Let's go back to the beginning of this whole, I don't even know what to call it constitutional avoidance for the record the court does this have to do with the payment of the attorney's fees because if it doesn't we are not the eighteen hundred dollars mr nix it will eventually get there yes if it doesn't we are not talking about it today i'm here to resolve the motion they filed asking me to hold you in contempt i'm not going to be deciding any other issues today um mr nix says i would like to have clarification of trinsley v parliago phenelic spelling spelling uh by the way i did look this case up uh it is uh, completely irrelevant to anything. Uh, the case is Trinzi v. Uh, Pagliero, which is a court saying the statements of counsel in the briefs or argument while enlightening the court are not sufficient for purposes of granting a motion, meaning you have to have evidence. That's all that means. Nothing to do with this case here. So uh, the court says, yep, you're not going to get that. Anything else? So am I being coerced into arranging a payment for $1,800 today? You know, uh, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, Nick says, can I get clarification of 42 U.S.C. subsection 12203, prohibiting us retaliation? No, you can't. I'm supposed to go to the library and get the book to read it. Whatever it says, it says. <laughs> um, 
Mr. Nix then goes on and says, is it a duty of an officer of the court to help a pro se litigant to properly represent himself or herself in a court of records? Now the judge is ready to pounce. You know, actually not. <laughs> it's not my job to do your homework for you. I have to be impartial. I'm supposed to be fair to the other side too. And you've had this case going for a while. I'm sure someone along the line has said to you, Mr. Nix, I have to treat you as a lawyer and no different. I don't really have a choice there. I'm going to move to my ruling now. Mm -hmm. uh, ask one more question, please. A quick one, fire away. Um, and he asks, uh, Ray Kent made this statement, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. Uh, nope. Uh, you should have taken this up some other time, not at this hearing for the contempt of court. Um, so there you go. He's talking about this constitutional avoidance stuff. I don't know what that is. And I don't need to know. Here is my ruling. And my ruling is that a contempt of court motion is not appropriate because this is uh, a judgment issue. And the only remaining issue at this point is collection. So you need to consult with uh, Federal Civil Procedure 69, uh, governing execution of money judgments. And there you go. Defends motion denied without prejudice. And that's it. So I guess he won. I, I guess he won because the defendant's motion was denied. Uh, he still has a judgment against him to pay the other side's legal fees. And that's it. And so <laughs> the judge then says, Honest to God, stop. There's no basis in law. <laughs> <laughs> and this, the frustration you feel right now is the frustration. There is no <laughs> court. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and so that's the end of it here. Um, Honest to God, stop. That's hilarious. The frustration with sovereign citizen stuff is basically this. What um, is it? Well, it's a, it's, it's a lot of things. And it's an ever-changing set of goalposts. Let's go back to this. Um, to this add for the event because that will at least give us some clue as to where Nick's might be going in his um in his uh presentation here so let's go back to this uh this thing that they have here um so yeah he uh did actually not win in federal court by using common law constitutional rights common law let's go to let's talk about this first because the the sovereign citizens people again they say all kinds of different things um in fact this um this this thumbnail i have in fact let me put this up because it's, it's hilarious this is the thumbnail we use for the video um this is the uh <laughs> this is by the way an actual thing that someone put on their car in a news story about this guy getting arrested charged with violent crime that's in a a common thing among sovereign citizens is they uh, often are not just like people that don't want to pay taxes, but people that are like violent criminals and things like that. Um, so they don't get what they want in court. So they try this route. Uh, so they've got all these uh, random citations of U S code, private property, first amendment, sex, second amendment. <laughs> that's here. Um American Israelites, Ninth Amendment, Tenth Amendment, not for hire, non-commercial, right to travel, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Royal Tribe of Judah, National Republic, Sovereign Hebrew, Israelite American, blah, 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 blah. Um, apparently, if you call it traveling, it's not driving, and therefore you don't need a license. That's a pretty common thing with the sovereign citizen people. Um, I can't imagine this ever working in a court. I don't know why people think it does. Um, Mindy says, is... Sovereign, whatever, the same as tech. Basically, <laughs> this is all basically the same thing. It's the legal system is bad. Therefore, we somehow have some kind of secret loopholes around it. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. So anyway, let's let's look at what this guy or what this um, Never kind of it. Republican Party claims this guy's going to say. Biblical principles will guide us back to the truth. What truth? What principles? And how does that relate to this previous sentence? I don't know. So basically, if we don't know our rights, how can we defend ourselves? That's a question you might ask Mr. Nix, but he's gonna, apparently going to tell you how to defend yourself, even though he doesn't really know it, know it very well. With what has happened in this world over the years, many are deceived by the word mandatory and executive order, amongst other things. We were taught not to question and to do as we are told from our leaders. John will cover Marbury versus Madison. And they quote this, in all in cases where a law conflicted with the Constitution, Marshall wrote, then the very essence of judicial duty was to follow the Constitution. In other words, the courts get it. If the law has it wrong, then something. Question mark, question mark, step three, profit. Um, let me enlighten you guys. This uh, is a remarkable, remarkable 
misstatement of what Marbury v. Madison actually was. In fact, Marbury v. Madison was the case that established the very thing the sovereign citizen people despise the most, judicial tyranny. This is the case that started it all. This is the case. That, so the background of this case is that um, John Adams was the second president. John Marshall, who is the Supreme, the, the chief justice of the Supreme Court in this case, was also John Adams' secretary of state. And as he's on his way out and Thomas Jefferson is on his way in, John Adams decides to stack the federal judiciary. <laughs> so he appoints a whole bunch of people, including this guy Marbury, to the federal judiciary. And his secretary of state, John Marshall, fails to deliver the proper letters to make Mar Marbury into a federal judge. <laughs> so Marbury sues um, the Jefferson administration. Madison is the secretary of state. And by the time this case gets heard by the U.S. Supreme Court, it's already basically a moot issue. But Marshall <laughs> wants to say that actually the Supreme Court and nobody else gets to decide what is and is not constitutional. There's no check by the states. There's no check by the people. There's no check by anybody else but the U.S. Supreme Court. This is actually the case that if people understood the Constitution, they would despise. Like, here's a quote from Thomas Jefferson. This is, a, this is now uh, 1819, so almost 20 years after the Marbury case, which in 1803, there's now a second U.S. Supreme Court case that was one of the foundational cases of judicial tyranny, the McCullough v. Maryland case, which is a case where now the uh, Supreme Court has decided that Congress has implied powers that are not written in the Constitution expressly. This is a huge, huge inroad into judicial tyranny. So Jefferson writes this, um, this other judge, um, Spencer Roan in Virginia, and he's very upset. He says, after 20 years, we find the judiciary on every occasion still driving us into consolidation, meaning consolidation of powers into a federal government because, remember, the Constitution was supposed to be this big states' rights thing. That's kind of how it was sold by the Federalist Papers. Mm -hmm. Jefferson wasn't there to criticize it because he was at, in Paris that year. This is all stuff, by the way, you're not going to learn from John Nix when you, if you go to see him at this thing. He doesn't know anything about any of this stuff. But anyway... Um, so they, they passed the Constitution. Jefferson says, the Constitution is a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, which they may twist and shape into any form they please. It should be remembered as an axiom of eternal truth in politics, that whatever power in any government is independent is absolute also. In theory only at first, while the spirit of the people is up, but in practice as fast as the public vigilance relaxes. That's Jefferson saying how mad he is about the federal judiciary essentially seizing the power to interpret the Constitution. Now, that decision, by the way, this Marbury v. Madison decision was four to zero. Four to zero. Why is that significant? Because all they said was, yeah, it's an Article Three. <laughs> it doesn't give anybody else the power to interpret the Constitution, does it? And by the way, the anti-federalists warned about all this stuff. They knew it was coming. Patrick Henry talked about this stuff. Here's a quote from one of the anti-federalist papers. Um, the judicial power shall extend, sorry, quoting Article 3, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution. So in the anti federalist papers, Brutus, it's a pseudonym, says, by this, this inequity, they are empowered to explain the Constitution according to the reasoning spirit of it without being confined to the words or letter. In other words, the anti federalist before the ratification of the Constitution says, yeah, you know, this. if you read this, this actually basically gives you judicial tyranny. It's going to take some time, but once, you know, little by little, little by little, they're going to get more and more and more. That's what the Anti-Federalists warned about. That's what Patrick Henry warned about. That's what Jefferson was bemoaning when he lost this case <laughs> as president, Marbury versus Madison. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure Mr. Nix is really going to have an illuminating analysis of this case. The case is going to basically be, you're going to tell you, folks, you're going to say, this is the Constitution. You ever see these guys, the the uh, pocket Constitution, the sovereign system, people love handing these out. This one's issued by Cato, not the classic ones. You've probably seen the smaller ones, the pocket Constitution with the with the uh, guy with the fife and drum on the cover. I used to hand out a lot of those. Um, <laughs> let me explain something to you, folks. This is not the, con this is what you wish was the Constitution. This is what these sovereign citizens say is the Constitution. You know what this is, folks? 
This is an old picture of a virgin girl. Okay. This is the hag she had become in 1952. What is this book with the seal of the United States on it? You can't really see in the camera. This is the annotated constitution. This is the constitution with case law of Supreme Court cases explaining how it works in the real world. So you have, oh, look at that, Ron Paul signature. Adam uh -huh. And you have, this is uh, issued by the U.S. Senate Printing Office, I think, the prepared by the Legislative Reference Service, Library of Congress, uh, nine, and it's annotations of cases decided by the Supreme Court of the United States to June 30th, 1952. So this is, this is an old photo yet. <laughs> this is, if you go to the section on patent law, it's like this is, patent law was still basically common law back then. Common law, since they talk about common law in this thing, common law is a small and dwindling <laughs> section of law where if statute doesn't say anything about it, then it might revert back to, you know, what was commonly understood to be the law in, in, in old England, you know, and that's getting smaller and smaller every day as more and more laws are passed. So here's what's, here's what's going on. We don't like what's happening. We wish there was some silver bullet. Where have we heard this before? We just have to have a constitutional convention, a convention of states, a balanced budget amendment. Just learn your rights. Just learn your rights and you'll win in court, except you'll lose in court, like John Nix does. Just like, just like Rick Martin saying, Oh yeah, just just go ahead and uh just go ahead and sue your local government. Because they don't have you know taxpayer funded lawyers or anything like that. Um <laughs> Matt Wilk says uh um this group loves the whole concept of applying their own reading of founding documents and calling it law. Sound familiar to Christina's group love this track. That, that's exactly what this is. It's wishful thinking. It's anything to avoid the bitter pill that is. There's no substitute for restoring our liberty except new leather work. And that means going up against, unfortunately, the, the entire power structure of this country, which is the mass media, the political establishment, and everything else. And actually, saying dumb things and doing dumb things that get yourselves put in jail is not a good strategy. John Nix did not stop the Cedar Springs public schools mandates. He lost his case, was ordered to pay 1800 bucks in legal fees, and now he's going around lying about it. And that's what the Kent County Republican Party apparently thinks is going to be a healthful move for our conservative movement. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, this will work. This will totally work. I guess I just wonder at these people who like, to start speaking as if there's these like experts on stuff like this, right? Don't they? I don't know. Yeah, a it's, lot it's, more, I get, it's you know? amazing. If you want to read like like an actual constitutional scar? Here's here's my recommendation for you. Get this book, Hologram of Liberty, Constitution: Shocking Alliance with Big Government, and it goes through. If you look at the source notes, the big source is the minutes of the Constitutional Convention and the letters of the founding fathers, and you know, sources. Um, it's all wishful thinking, guys. All wishful thinking. You want an easy way out because life is hard. Well, sorry. Um, and, it, and the other thing I would say, too, is it's also very cowardly. It really is. Like, I can understand, like, if, if you want to say um, our government is evil and kills people and doesn't do any good for anybody and it's immoral and I'm going to refuse to pay tax and if they throw me in jail or execute me, so be it. That's, I mean, that's there's some nobility in that compared to there's a secret loophole. There's a secret loophole that if you just file the right kind of paperwork and you make the right arguments, when you get pulled over, they won't give you a ticket and you go to court, you won't, the judge will say, oh, <laughs> you're right, guys. You can walk right out of here. Yeah. Oh, you, and this, the, the theories never end. Oh, the gold fringe on the flag means it's maritime law. Really? Find me one case where they cite maritime law. Oh, the, the, the Bar Association, the BAR. That's an acronym. stands for British Accredited Register. These are all things these people say. Really, find me one case citation where they cite to the British law, other than, you know, other than the common law you guys love so much. 
It's unbelievable. It's, it's a trap, guys. The trap, because guess what they want you to do? They want you in the news. So instead of talking about Joe Biden's open border, they're talking about local yokel going to jail for threatening, for threatening their local election officials, maybe. Hanging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's that too. Unreal. By the way, the ball kicker, James Chapman, for those who don't know, is now filed as a candidate for state house. In Walk your in county. county. Your yep. county. Yep, well, we'll see how that goes. There is an actual candidate in that race. So um, I fingers crossed the Democrats will vote in their own primary and not cross over to vote for James Chapman. Uh, but there again, you know, this is a guy who at the state convention, controlled by the disruptors, they elevated him to be a state delegate. And some of them voted for him to be a national delegate. A guy with a, who served 10 years in prison for violent crimes. A guy who's been accused of sexual assaults. A guy who brought great embarrassment to the, huh? Extortion. Extortion. Yeah, I mean, the list is endless. We could be here all night just talking about James Chapman's criminal record. That's apparently who the Republican Party of the disruptors mm -hmm. like. They encourage him. They enable him. He's a good, he's a good, he's a great American. Fallon, you know, but, oh, you know, other than that, other than yep. all the violent criminal history and all the rest. Yeah. Jason said, sounds, sounds like a beaut. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see if the Washington County GOP wants to have him on our executive committee next cycle. Uh, what else we got this week? Uh, oh, um, there's been a lawsuit filed. Uh, for the wrongful death of Ashley Babbitt, which I don't know. Um, it's filed by Judicial Watch, which is an organization which uh, people rightly have a great deal of respect for. And here's the case. You can, I'm sure you can find this on Judicial Watch's homepage uh, if you want to read through the whole thing. We are not going to read the whole thing tonight. Um, but just to get to the basics of it, um, First is uh, essentially the shooting death, obviously. I'm worried about this just because uh, Andrew Branca, who is the law of self-defense attorney, literally the only attorney in America, to my knowledge, whose expertise is entirely self-defense law, says, unfortunately, might not like to hear this, but he says this is a justifiable self-defense case because, you know, first off, you have to, you have, you have to put aside any question of fairness, because that doesn't matter, you know? Uh, you get pulled over for speeding, you can't say, well, the guy in front of me was speeding. You can't say, Capitol Police never shot any Antifa protesters. The test is, what if, instead of being Trump supporters that were at the Capitol doing these exact same things, what if it was the exact same set of circumstances, but they were Antifa? What do you think about them entering the Capitol and breaking through windows and, and going through a barricaded door? Well... And again, Branca went through this whole thing. There's five elements of self-defense, innocence, imminence, proportionality, reasonableness, and avoidance. Avoidance doesn't count because he was a cop on duty in his jurisdiction, the Capitol. Innocence, obviously, he was a cop, not a, not a perpetrator, didn't start the fight. Proportionality. Um, you can't just say, and as they say here, they say, well, she, uh, she was unarmed. Yes, but when you're in a mob of people that are breaking through a door, it's a reasonable assumption that the whole group is acting as one body. And, uh, you know, I mean, maybe this case will get to discovery and some interesting things will come out of it, but this will all take a long, long time. If it doesn't get dismissed, this will take a long, long time. But what's it going to be? Well, it's going to be more January 6th in the news. Oh, wonderful. I love January 6th being in the news more and more and more. I don't know. I, I I shouldn't criticize Judicial Watch. I know they've done many great things, many, many great things. So I'm hesitant to see how this case goes. But yeah. uh, that's a good point, though. If some other stuff comes out that's actually true, but, you know, will people hear about it? Who knows? Or they just hear the same old rhetoric, you know? Well, if there's anything interesting that comes out, the media is not going to cover it. It's part of the right. problem. That's what I'm saying, um, right? Yeah, I mean, there are there are some points they make here in particular, and I did kind of skim through the facts of the case. One thing they do bring up is that Ashley was basically directed by police to continue on into the into the hallway. 
Um, so there's arguments there. So there may be arguments that could come forth in discovery, mm-hmm. but you know, it's, it's okay. a civil suit. It, it's a civil suit um, where it's going to be very, very expensive for the plaintiffs, which is Judicial Watch and their donors. And the defendant is the people that print the money, that have all the money in the world. So they can afford all the discovery. So we'll see. Maybe some things come out of this, but I am not terribly optimistic. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, guys. Um, but there it is. Um, and the other big story this week, of course, is uh, the Trumpster, who said... Uh, Trumpster? Is that what you call them? Yeah. Uh, who is said... Uh, he will be. A, he will gladly become a modern day Nelson Mandela. It will be my great honor. Well, I mean, I, I think there is something to be said about being a political prisoner. However, that does also limit your ability to campaign. It also does limit your ability to, you know, use your money for campaigning, which is, of course, the Democrats' legal strategy. And there's also the question of what you're being politically imprisoned for doing. Because if you're politically imprisoned for, you know, something that shouldn't be a crime at all, like the president doing whatever he pleases with his classified information, that's his. Uh, That's one thing. But the issue is that this judge, Merchan, Merchan, I don't know how to pronounce it, who is not allowing me to talk, thereby violating the law and the Constitution, is so bad what he's trying to get away with. How was he even chosen for this case? Or he fought like hell to get it, and all the rest of them also. I mean, I wouldn't rely on what you had heard about the judge if you're going to make that accusation. If this partisan hack wants to put me in the clink for speaking the open and obvious truth, I will gladly become a modern-day Nelson Mandela. It would be my great honor. Well, yeah, I like to call it the clink. Um, so here's the, for those who don't know, um, the issue, I guess, stems from this uh, Trump post on Truth Social. The judge's daughter is allowed to post pictures of her dream of putting me in jail. The Manhattan DA is allowed to say whatever lies about me he wants. The judge can violate our laws and constitution at every turn, but I'm not allowed to talk about the attacks against me and the lunatics trying to destroy my life. Maybe the judge's such a hater because his daughter makes money by working to get Trump, and when he rules against me over and over again, he's making her company and her richer and richer. How can this be allowed? Reasonable question. Mm-hmm. Um, However, uh, apparently, what happened is that the judge's daughter gave up her Facebook account. It used to be hers, <laughs> where she was very obviously a partisan Trump hater. Uh, there, there's pronouns. former there's the pronouns. Yeah. Pron- 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 you got the I voted sticker on her face. Um, grab him by the Putin, repeal and replace Trump. So you got a hard, hardcore lefty rally there. Um. But apparently, he shut down her account, and someone else picked it up. Apparently, I guess. Um, in her name, though. It's very strange. Yeah, very strange. Um, strange set of facts. What makes you say someone else picked it up? That's what this reporter is claiming. Oh, the um, uh, Let's see here. says here the account does seem to once have been used here's a screenshot of it from 2020 um but then it was apparently created again on april 2023 mm. um, well, that's twitter that's not facebook but i think this is all face this is all twitter i mean isn't it here's this is all this is all twitter oh is it oh okay sorry yeah yeah um but you know the, the point being You know, if you're going to go to jail for, you know, violating a court order, it'd be really good to have a really airtight, you know, narrative rather than, uh, well, because I was attacking the judge's daughter for tweets that I thought were hers but might have actually not been. That doesn't look good. Um, (laughs) Thomas Richards says the Kent kind of GOP is nothing more than a clown show now that the Marxist mob voted out all the actual Republicans. Jason, I'm sure he was his in response says, I'm sorry, I'm going to fix that. Yep. Um, 
Oh, also on Rumble, Hurlback says Mr. Nick sounds like a sovereign citizen. Yeah, definitely he was traveling. Um, Barry Altman says the GOP has a problem with forgiveness of ancient history mistakes. Some cultures are not forgiving white slave owners. If that guy changed his life, he should be considered for his pursuits. Um, Who's that guy? I guess this Chapman, I guess he's talking about. Uh, Chapman's mistakes are not ancient history, Barry. Well, he continues <laughs> yeah. to, to, this, to this day. That's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, anyway. It's his so, present. It's his present as well, not just his past. Yeah. So, I mean, where do we go from here, folks? Democrats are actually are actually destroying our country with their policies. And Republicans are, let's hold my beer. Let's tell you uh, what we want to do. We want to... Um, we want to attack judges and their daughters, which I'm sure he's got a fair question about, but there's a smarter way to say it that I'm sure his lawyers did not appreciate him doing it this way. Well, I mean, um, <laughs> Judicial Watch is filing a suit for Ashley Babbitt, keeping January 6th in the news. Ken County GOP is making sovereign citizen kookery mainstream. And um, yeah, and, uh, you know, and, and Tim Wahlberg's talking about... Uh, I'm sorry, he's not talking about nuking Palestine. He just wants to get it over with very, very quickly. I don't know how you do that. I guess you could starve them all to death. That'd be relatively quickly. You could you could gas them too, you know. That'd be that'd be a quick way to end it, relatively speaking. Stop. What does this guy mean, Marvin? Troy, Michigan Republicans are gone. What does that mean? I don't know. Um <laughs> Troy has a very bad representation in Lansing. I know that for sure. Um both uh, in terms of the Democrats and also, um, and actually even before the Republicans from Troy and Rochester, that's a very bad corner of the state right there. Rochester has uh, Michael Weber and uh, Mark Tisdell and yeah, a lot, of, a lot of bad votes there. Speaking of bad votes, um, coming up this week, guys, um, we're going to be going back hard at the Washington this coming week. They are coming back, I think Wednesday. Uh, and we have heard from Speaker Mike Johnson, his first priorities are going to be renewing the warrantless mass surveillance program that was deployed against us. And uh, and also, by the way, uh, sending another 70 billion bucks to Ukraine and Israel. That's fantastic. That's so why did we get rid yeah. of the other guy for this guy again? Uh, well, the hope, I think, was that we elected Jim Jordan to be the next speaker. But unfortunately, John James screwed us out of that. Oh, so um, the only one was he? No, but he was the only one in Michigan that did that. Mm. Um, yeah, but yeah, uh, Johnson is completely off the deep end. Um, no longer even pretending to be any kind of America First character. Complete and total one eighty. Um, embarrassing. So we'll see how the Michigan delegation votes on all these things. I assume the worst because so far they've been horrible. Um, but we are going to start getting their emails going. In fact, I just updated the contact info. What we do when we contact Lansing, when you guys sign our petition, by the way, I don't know if anyone knows it. People understand this. Um, not everybody in the internet delivers your petitions faithfully, um, but we do. We actually send them uh, directly to your state lawmakers, right to their email addresses. And they often contact me and they're very upset about these things. In Washington, they make it very, very, very hard to contact your congressman through email. They have a whole electronic system with a web form that they use um, that we can't interact with. So we just email them to their legislative directors and also we're going to copy their district directors on these things too. Um, they actually do pay attention to these things, folks. They really do. There's a reason why they haven't renewed FISA up till this point. Uh, FISA is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That's the thing that is the warrantless mass surveillance program under 702. Look for those emails uh, tomorrow and Tuesday. Um, don't be silent about this stuff, guys. Don't let Tim Wahlberg get away with saying a bunch of garbage and thinking that there's not going to be any any political price to pay because that's why they do it. That's why they do it. Because they think, oh, they're going to vote for me anyway. Mindy well, says, who did Johnson make a right deal with? Deal. That's what, yeah. um, you know, on Tucker Carlson, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene this past week was seriously talking about this might be a uh, a blackmail thing. Which is not too far fetched. For what? For Johnson? For anybody. Um, 
What I'm sorry. What, other is a black, what is a blackmail thing? Well, they were they didn't get into specifics because I don't think they have specifics. But Margie Taylor Green was talking to Tucker this past week, and um, and she suggested that that Johnson might be blackmailed from some by some uh, way or another, which is not not unheard of. You know, I mean, the FBI, CIA, obviously. <laughs> so it's back to Jedgar Hoover. Um, I remember my my Senate Majority Leader in Rhode Island. The FBI was going after him for like two years, and the guy was they, they had his chief of staff bugged, and the guy was actually squeaky clean. Um, and they got him anyway, <laughs> just because they just make shit up. Um, and that's the way that goes. Um, Emma Birch said, I saw Garrett so Donald told people to unify around Mike Rogers. I, Emma, yeah. send me that link yeah. if you find it. That's that is highly, highly instructive if that's true, but I can't confirm that until I see the evidence. But I've seen that yeah, it was started maybe yesterday, he or this morning, and then I think he did a live stream today encouraging people to, you know, ask questions or whatever and trying to explain what he meant or I'm not sure. So <laughs> I don't know. Funny. I didn't, very, I very didn't funny. watch. So, but yeah, he did. Interesting. Well, we will have to, we will have to see. And I'll, I'll give Emma a moment or two if she can find the link to it. We can, well, you know, I'll tell you what, Emma, um, put, put it, put it in the chat or something or in the, uh, in a, in a comment on Facebook or something so that we can talk, we can cover it. Uh, when we have the source, if we find a source for it. Um, if you go to his but, Facebook page, you can see, or his Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't want to do that while we're live on air. Um, Cause you know, yeah, might, okay. be, might be plotting around for a little while there. Okay. But, um, but yeah, it'd be nice if one of these days we could just go out and talk about how the Democrats are so bad, but you know, yeah. and, the, 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 and people come back and say, Adam, you're the, you're the, you're the problem. You're the one who keeps, bringing up all this dirty laundry. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, I didn't make these remarks. Uh, Barry says yesterday on Soldano. On Twitter, um, yeah, and fight both Facebook, yeah. His grassroots army, It's that's the name of the account, I think, now. Um, that's true, uh, Sharon. Yeah, I, I did read that. He, he, did, he just said uh, unify. We'll he didn't say unite behind Rogers, but. Yeah. He did an interview with Mike Rogers and then said it'd be better for the party to unify him because it's a better option than Marxists. Um, I, I've I've done my lesser of two evil spiel a few times, including once recently, so I'll, I'll refrain from doing that again tonight. But I'm sure we'll come back to talk about that again, maybe perhaps after the primary to talk about that. So there you go. All right, I think that's going to do it for us for tonight. Uh, okay. hope you guys all so get to enjoy the To remind everyone. <laughs> Yes, go ahead, please. So um, April 23rd is the deadline if you want to run for office, um, state house, county commissions, um, township boards, et cetera. Um, it's recommended yep. to, you to pay the $100 fee. You know, don't try to get the signatures. If you can, just pay the $100 and sign up. Library board, school board, et cetera. That's April 23rd. May 7th is the deadline to file your affidavit of identity with the county clerk if you wanna be a precinct delegate um, and you wanna be on the ballot. There, after that, you would be a write-in, but if you wanna be on the ballot, that's that deadline is then. Our county is having a sign up this Thursday. Um, so if you go follow Wayne Sixth County Republican Committee, you can see the information about that. And we're going to have a few more. This is just the first one. We're going to try to do three, I believe. Oh, school board is in July. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, those are nonpartisans. Yep. Well, okay. I was confused because the what I read today in the article said, or in the, um, on the Secretary of State website, it said not partisan and nonpartisan, both on April 23rd. That doesn't sound right. I don't know. I'll, I'll send it to you after and see. So, okay. um, anyway, so. Uh, yeah, so that that's if you want to sign up to be a precinct delegate. Yeah, which you need to be a precinct delegate, folks. If you if you don't want people in charge of your party who are actively actively damaging its reputation and getting its members uh, into severe legal problems, you need to elect sane people to run your county party. And that requires you guys to become precinct delegates. It's simple. Just file a form. Go to your county clerk's office and file the form. That's all you got to do. And run for something if you can. 
Um, Darren says, Garrett did not say unify. He just said we need to unify. He interviewed other Senate candidates before, too. Okay, so whatever. We'll see. We'll see where that goes. Mm-hmm. All right. I think you got anything else for us, Patty? No, just that stuff. So, yeah, just be mindful of, of those deadlines. And, um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mindy says, KK supporters in stand-up Michigan, previously for freedom of government, you not apply. Oh, they're coming. That's the only election they care about. Is the is taking over the GOP? They are obsessed with it. They they obviously don't care about winning elections, and they wouldn't be doing stuff like, uh, you know, they wouldn't be doing stuff like this if they cared about winning elections. Um, we had a good day horrible. yesterday, door knocking. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. yeah, it was a nice. It was a beautiful day. You mean you try to win elections by knocking on doors? It's nice. <laughs> so there you go, folks. Um, become a precinct delegate. More on that coming soon too. Uh, until then, as always, thanks for all you guys do for Liberty. More streams to come this week. And until next time, peace.